Good morning, Gap Church, and a big welcome to all visitors that will be with us this morning. We uh, really welcome you with us, and we hope you have a blessed time as you hear God's word this morning. Uh, news for our own family, Percy is safely in Port Shepston, and so please keep remembering to pray for him. It's going to be tough for a while for him to be away from this church family that he's been a part of for so long, so remember him. My call to worship this morning is from Psalm 84, and as I was reading it, I think it could well be a bit of a cry from all of our hearts to be back worshipping together. We do miss each other so much, but it is beautiful. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord, for being back together in Gap. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let's pray as we commit the service. Father, our hearts do cry out so much to, to be together again and meeting as one body. But we are inspired and encouraged by the fact that you are our God in the midst of wherever we are and that you are doing a work amongst your people and that your kingdom and your church is growing even at this time when we're not meeting in our normal places. But people are hearing your word in their homes and many people who don't even normally come to church are able to hear your word through this means that we're using. And Father, we are reminded that you are always above all things the Lord above all lords, the God that reigns above any other gods. And we praise you and we thank you. We ask that you would be with us and that you would soften our hearts as we go into the service this morning. Amen. God bless you all as we go into a time of worship together. God is great. 
Good morning everyone. It's time to take up our tithes and offerings, which you can do via SnapScan or EFT using the SnapScan code or banking details which appear on the screen. In Matthew 11 verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That means that no matter where we come from, no matter what our cultural background, our financial status, or our geographic location is, there is unity and love in the body of Jesus Christ. As his body, it is our responsibility to continue Jesus' ministry every day, and that's why it's so important for us to give unto God's kingdom. As the body of Christ, we have a job to do, to support the work of the ministry and to bring the light of Christ into places of darkness. When you give, know that your gift is going to be used to further the kingdom of God. Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 21, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Let's pray. O Heavenly Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant eternal life. You have said that you are a good Father who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Enjoy the rest of our service. Good morning, Gap family. We've come to the part of our service now where we bring our concerns before Almighty God. We bring our concerns not only for ourselves, but especially for those around us, the greater community and those whom we love. Let us pray. Our Father, your name is holy. Your power is great and you are an almighty God. And so, Lord, we come before you and we ask that in your great mercy, you will forgive us. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us the strange and sinful thoughts that we are having. Cleanse our minds. Cleanse our hearts. And Lord, give us the strength to forgive those who have wronged us. And so, Lord, with that cleansing, we come now and we approach your throne. We come this morning with great burdens. We have an incredible burden, Lord, of concern for so many out there. We ask, Lord, that you look at our country. You look at our President Ramaphosa and his cabinet. We pray for incredible wisdom in all the decisions that they make. Lord, this past week and the past month, there have been so many strange decisions and going backwards and forwards. We pray, Lord, that their advisors and even the scientists and the experts who advise them will advise them, Lord, only with truth and not, Lord, with selfish agendas. May truth, Lord, prevail, and may incredible wisdom, Lord, guide the ultimate decisions for the good of everybody in this country. We pray for our city. We pray, Lord, that you be in the decisions of our city councillors. So much selfishness is going around there. Lord, a city council that can't even get together and hold a proper meeting. I pray for our city, Lord, and I pray that our councillors will ultimately, Lord, work together for the good of all the citizens of this wonderful city. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. I come now, Lord, and I bring before you the many members of Gap Church who are suffering from the COVID-19 infection. We pray, Lord, that your will be that they all be healed. We pray, Lord, that your will be that their pain will be very low. I pray now and thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have so graciously healed and brought through this symptoms, Lord, of COVID-19, so many of our congregants and so many of the community of people whom we love. 
I pray now, Lord, for people with other diseases. I ask, Lord, that it be your will that they also be healed. And we ask, Lord, that especially people going through cancer, people going through treatment for cancer, you, Lord, are the ultimate healer. We know that the name of Jesus is greater than the name of any disease. We know the name of Jesus is greater than the fear of cancer. I ask, Lord, that you be especially now this week with Tanil and the family, Brian and Joy and their families. Lord, as Tanil goes for an incredibly delicate operation, you, Lord, be the master surgeon. You, Lord, be the healer. You, Lord, be the one who guides every hand of caring that goes with her. And we ask, Lord, for incredible peace for that entire family. We ask, Lord, that everywhere where treatment is going in the name of Jesus, you heal. Lord, you go and you go with every person going through chemotherapy this week. We pray, Lord, that you be with everybody going for operations, whatever those operations this week are. We thank you, Lord, that Kevin has returned safely from Cape Town. And we thank you, Lord, that he's looking to return to his normal life soon. We ask, Lord, for complete healing for him in due time. We ask that this be your will. Father, we come now and we say, please, Lord, provide us our daily bread. Our country and the world in total world, Lord, is in economic ruin. Lord, we know that this need not have been so, but it has been caused by the greed of a few people that now, Lord, we're sitting in a situation where people cannot fend for themselves. We pray now, Lord, that you provide everybody with their daily bread. We ask, Lord, that you look after people. Father, and we pray that where those people have got many resources, create in them, Lord, a generous spirit, so that no person, Lord, will not have their daily needs met. We ask, Lord, that all these things be done to the glory of your name. The kingdom, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will, Lord, on this earth be done. And as we now look at the word of God, as we look, Lord, at the sermon Rory has bringing to us, Lord, may the power and the glory of your name be great. In Jesus' name. Amen.
you stay the same your love Good morning and thank you for joining us on this lovely day. Uh, today the sermon will be a continuation of the daily devotionals on Daniel. Every now and then one of the stories is too extensive for an eight minute devotional and so I've included it as the sermon this morning. Whenever in life someone's about to face the consequences of his actions and there is a sense of impending doom, we use the expression the writing is on the wall. And that expression comes from the story in chapter 5. It was the last evening of the Babylonian Empire when Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, lost everything his grandfather had built up. Nebuchadnezzar, who had become a believer in the Most High God, reigned for 43 years. And after his death and various conspiracies, Nabonidus took power and married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And now Nabonidus is away on a campaign in Arabia and he appoints as co-ruler his son Belshazzar. So in the chapter, when it refers to Nebuchadnezzar being the father of uh, Belshazzar, it really is the grandfather or ancestor of Belshazzar. So Nebuchadnezzar was the grandfather, uh, his grandfather. Now the incident occurred. On the evening of October 539 BC, the armies of Darius the Mede are at the very gates of the city of Babylon. They'd been besieging it for five years, but they weren't able to scale the walls, which are 30 meters high, and there's 40 meter towers protecting the walls. And that evening, this playboy prince Belshazzar decides to have a drunken orgy of a party. Half the size of a rugby field is the size of this banqueting hall. There were a thousand people there. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of this room. It's half the size of a rugby field. This is the story, therefore, of the party that went wrong. And the primary cause of the failure of this party was alcohol. 
when we drink, our inhibitions go, our natures are revealed, and we show that our hearts are essentially corrupt. Remove those things like societal restraint, and we act as animals. We try and forget our obligations by drinking alcohol, but it often just makes it worse. So on that fateful evening, Belshazzar tries to do a very brash thing, perhaps for the thrill of shocking people. Sometimes we, we do that. We blaspheme intentionally. And Belshazzar remembered that his grandfather had brought from the Jerusalem temple, which he'd conquered many years before, articles of gold and silver. And they would have been stored in some very safe place. And he now calls for them to be brought out for this orgy. His grandfather had believed in the Most High God, and his grandfather would not have approved of what Belshazzar was about to do. Be careful when you play with supernatural things as Belshazzar was doing. They often have a kickback. When we challenge the Most High God, be sure that he will take up that challenge, which he did on this particular evening. Now, he would have been sitting under a, a niche, an alcove in the wall, and there would have been a torch, a lit torch above him, when suddenly he saw something supernatural, there was a hand writing on the wall. And his cup fell from his hands, his blood ran cold, and his heart stopped. He screamed and shouted for the wise men to come and tell him what it meant. But they did not know what it meant, because they did not know who had written it. It was written in Arabic, a language that they did understand, but it was written in praisi form or telegram form with no objects or subjects. Let me give you an example. If, if you received a, a telegram saying, David, 5th of January, 10, 12 p.m., 3.6 kgs, both well, if you didn't know the details, you wouldn't actually understand it. But if you did know the details, you would know that a baby boy, David, was born on the 5th of January, at 12 minutes after 10, weighing 3.6 kgs, and both baby and mother are well, because you know from whom it comes. And the Bible is filled with messages from God, but if we don't know the author, we actually don't know what they mean. So next in the story, the, queen's, uh, the queen Nebuchadnezzar's daughter and, and uh, uh, Belshazzar's mother reminds her son that there was a man, Daniel, who used to uh, be in power in her grandfather's time, in his grandfather's time, a man who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. It's the same phrase that Nebuchadnezzar used about God. And Daniel, now 86 years old, is called to interpret the message. There's no retirement for the servants of God. There's no discharge in this war, it's been said. Some of you older folk might feel you, you passed being used in any form of effective ministry. But as with Daniel, God might call you to be a, a spokesman for him and use the right words at the right time. So Daniel arrives and steps into the chaos of this drunken orgy. And first he preaches a sermon to Belshazzar and speaks to him about his folly. Reminds him of how his grandfather came to faith and the Most High God. And despite these lessons, Belshazzar has ignored God. It has been said that there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of heaven. God has no grandchildren. You can't get to heaven on the coat strings of a godly partner or, or, or a godly ancestor. You've got to make a decision for yourself. Now let me read from Daniel's words to uh, Belshazzar, and, and I pick also a few select verses. I read from verses 18, and then 20 to 28, and then verse 30. O King, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Then from verse 20, but when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. 
But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Verse 30, that very night Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So that night Belshazzar mocked God, mocked the living God, and they drank from these holy sacred vessels. The folly of human nature, when we know even the dangers before us, and yet we continue to play with sin. Belshazzar lifted himself up and he worshipped the gods of stone and gold and silver, thinking he could get away with it. But unlike with his grandfather, Belshazzar was given no second chance. So Daniel interprets these words written in almost a pricey form on the wall. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Mene means numbered. Belshazzar's days are numbered and his reign is about to end. Tekel means weighed. His life has been weighed in the scales and it has been found to be wanting. He is too light. Parson, or its singular Perez, means several things. His kingdom was about to be destroyed, was about to perish. But there was a play on words here. Perez also means Persia. Your kingdom is about to be destroyed and given over to the Medes and Persians. You see, at that very moment, the the troops of Darius the Mede were entering the city. Uh, History teaches that that the Medes and Persians had been besieging the city of Babylon for five years, but they they couldn't uh, get into the city with its 25-meter walls and its 35-meter towers. They could not get over the walls, so they came underneath. And they did this by diverting the waters of the Euphrates, which flowed under the city, and the walls came down to the Euphrates River. But they diverted the water into a swamp higher up. And so for a, temporarily, the waters dropped two or three meters, and then they were able to wade through under the wall and into the city. Belshazzar's last official act would be to honor Daniel, but it was pointless. All the honors that the world gives us will one day mean nothing. They will pass away. Someone has quipped, what value uh, did Winston Churchill, what value were the medals to Winston Churchill that were on his coffin? The title of John Ortberg's book, It All Goes Back in the Box, is a clear reminder that one day it will all end and we carry nothing with us into the future. So that evening, Darius the mean Mede gained control of Babylon at the age of 62, fulfilling prophecies by Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel. Now you might ask, what relevance has this story of the judgment of an arrogant king in faraway Babylon two and a half thousand years ago got to do with us in the 21st century? And the answer is that there's the same God who judged Belshazzar's lifestyle is the same God before whom one day we all will stand, and the same statements may be said of us. One certainty we are all aware of is the fact that there will come a day for each one of us when God calls it in. And Mene will be written against our name. It will be closing time. Our days are numbered. It is unavoidable and will take place no matter how young, powerful, rich or intelligent you are. There will come a day. And we need to live life in that reality that our days are numbered. God knows our birth date and our death date, says Psalm 139. When we use the quip carpe diem, seize the day, we're saying make every opportunity of the day that you have in front of you. Don't waste it. Mene, your days are numbered. The next thing that is a dead cert is that you will have, or you will be weighed in the scales. Tackle. Scripture says that after death comes judgment. Every one of us will stand before the living God, and God will judge the living and the dead. Every deed done, every thought, every motive, every word. And it will be put on the scales. And it will be true. He will have all the facts before him. And the truth is, like Belshazzar, we will all be found wanting. We will be light in the face of his perfect law. We all have broken his law again and again. And it will be written against our names, Tekel. 
you have been found wanting. And now the third and last thing, and this one can go either of two ways. We will all deserve to hear the word perez, which means you will perish and be destroyed forever. But here is the word but, and it's that fantastic word, which means while we cannot avoid mene, our days being numbered, or tekel that be found wanting, we can avoid perez. God has offered a way of escape from eternal judgment. It is because someone else has offered to pay the price and to die in my place. Someone has had the words Perez written against his name. You will perish. Someone who didn't deserve to die, who didn't have numbered days, and who wasn't found wanting in the scales. Yet he chose voluntarily to have the name Perez written against his name. His name is Jesus Christ. While we were sinners, Christ died for us says scripture. Wicked men arrested him and told him his days were numbered. They tried him unjustly and told him he was found wanting. And then they gave him the judgment of death. It was to be by Roman crucifixion with six inch nails hammered through his hand and feet. It was to be the cruelest form of torture that man has ever invented. Perez. But on that cross, Jesus was taking our judgment. He took your Perez and he offered you life. Now the decision today is not complicated. You can either choose to one day stand before God on your own and face his judgment and be found wanting. Or you can choose life. And we know the verse, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the word, Perez. Yet for some reason people choose to reject God and not believe in him. Many people make decisions which are temporary and, and it's like a seed that dries in the sun or, or their, their life dries up or it's choked out by the weeds and cares of this world. They make uh, commitments which don't really last under the pressures. But some make it through to the end. They hold on to life that they have received when they came to faith in Jesus Christ. They have never let go. And for those faithful few you will one day hear the words, not perish, not you will perish, but they'll hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come in and share the inheritance that I have won for you. I've prepared a place for you. And so today I want to invite you, wherever you are and wherever you're sitting, to actually make a decision for Christ. My father-in-law gave his life to Jesus sitting in front of the TV when Billy Graham was preaching and he stood up and made a commitment to Christ. Many of us who are listening have done so, but you might not be one of those people. And I would really invite you to come and commit yourself to Jesus Christ today. So I'm going to pray what is called a believer's prayer for you and on your behalf. And you can pray it quietly in your own hearts. And if you pray it with your hearts, you can know without doubt God's promise that you will be a child of God. Come, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know that my days will one day be numbered. I know that I will be found wanting because I have disobeyed you in so many ways and so many areas in my life. But I thank you, Jesus, that you died in my place and took my punishment on your shoulders. And God, I don't deserve it and never will, but I receive your offer of grace and forgiveness and salvation that you offer me today. And so, Lord, I ask you to come in and take over my life, that you would be my God, the Most High God who is above all. I believe and trust in you, and I give my life to you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for starting again. Thank you for the promise of eternal life which you offer me. Thank you that today my name can be written in the book of life, and I can be a son or daughter of the living God, that I have nothing to fear, but I can face the future with great joy, hope, and anticipation, knowing that one day... I will enjoy your presence eternally. Keep me strong. Keep me serving you. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Now, if you're able to make that commitment, let me suggest you go and tell someone today that today I gave my heart to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Let's close the service as we sing a last worship song. Thank you so much for joining us.
down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw. Desperate for you, I surrender. Crunch my soul. As mercy and grace unfold, a hunger and thirst, a hunger and thirst, with arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry, speak to me. Morning, everyone. I trust you've all enjoyed the service. Let us end in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time we spent together this morning. I pray that 
each one of us can go into the week ahead knowing that you are with us. I pray for wisdom in all the decisions we might need to make and that your hand will be upon all our families, our friends and our loved ones. Thank you, Father God, for your mercy and your grace and your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.